The documentary Ancient Apocalypse by Graham Hancock has been strangely successful. Perhaps this is so because it invites us, for a change, to ponder something or rather someone we are usually barred from thinking and commemorating in a cherishing and charitable way, our ancestors. We are also invited to ponder our mythological and cosmic origin of which the early philosophers, even Plato, still knew and spoke. Hancock's warning against human hubris, against the belief that technology can solve all problems, is a precious one. And it seems that the moral that he wants to relate is that we have an origin which is and remains significant for us, even though it lies remotely in the past. That is, we are precisely not cut off from our origin, no matter how advanced we might deem ourselves, but that forgetting our origin will have terrifying consequences. I believe that Graham Hancock's intentions are pure and still I am convinced, and I will argue here why, that his project will do more harm than good. And this is not just another attempt to disprove Hancock as there are so many out there now. The many moments of mere hyperbole, the backward argumentation and the multiple non sequiturs in his reasonings do not need to be debunked. Still I need to turn my attention to this because I believe that the reason why this documentary has been so successful is because memory itself is the most pivotal phenomenon and dimension of our only beginning epoch. And I have to admit that I am not familiar with Hancock's life work, besides his most recent documentary. Of course, I admire his unwavering attitude and his stamina in the face of decades of ridicule and I want to applaud his relentless attacks on the ossified structures of contemporary academia, in his case, the academics of archaeology. As Hancock claims, the majority of academic archaeologists often appear to be rather clueless about the disciplines and deep knowledge of astronomy, mythology and philosophy, and how they also play a crucial role for archaeology. Instead, this discipline, as most others, is trapped in its own privileging of the presence, of the present moment, but also of its own presence. And here we are already getting closer to the heart of the matter. Hancock criticizes the prevalent logic of progress, which must privilege the presence and which forgets the past. Yet, does not Hancock himself privilege the presence as well? Does he not fall at least for some of the pieties of our time? Does he approach the question of ancestral memory radically enough? You see, the main tension that arises in the series, and I would suspect in all of Hancock's work, and indeed in his thinking, is that he does not pursue the ideas and myths in their own right, but that he remains an empiricist who wants to beat the empiricist science of archaeology with its own means. And let me just say for those who are not familiar with philosophy, there's a crucial distinction between empirical and empiricist. Empirical means to go by experience, but to have something else than just experience guiding the experience, for example, idealism. But empiricist means to be really stuck and remain purely with, a, with the experience, for example, with the factual, with that, with that which can be measured, etc. Hence, also in uh, the series, it's very often purely about what can be measured and what can be found thanks to new technology, etc. So before I can address this further, let me briefly summarize how I've understood the work or what's being presented here. Hancock believes that there was an ancient civilization before the Ice Age, which was differently but still extremely advanced in terms of science and technology. And different to popular belief and scientific dogma, Hancock does not buy the ordinary story that sometime after the Ice Age, hunters and gatherers suddenly started to settle and breed cattle and develop agriculture. Instead, before the Ice Age, the unnamed advanced civilization had already developed much more than just sophisticated agriculture. Yet because of a climatic catastrophe, hypothesized by Hancock to have been caused by meteors, a great flood followed by the Ice Age, destroyed almost everything about this original civilization, which apparently was a global one. There were, however, some survivors who continued to sail the Earth. We suffer, Hancock is convinced, from amnesia about our past. 
This amnesia bars us, Hancock seems to imply, from understanding who we truly are. In order to argue for his theory, he relates various myths and stories of great floods which can be found across the globe. Think of Noah's Arch, for example. This, he argues, should be seen as an indication that the flood was real and was indeed global. He also relates the myth of Prometheus, the fire-bringing titan in Greek mythology, which he sees as evidence of survivors of the ancient advanced civilization bringing the knowledge of handling fire to other less advanced tribes, and that allowed them to settle. Hancock does not mention that the Titans in Greek mythology stand for chaos and upheaval, while the Olympians, for example the fire god Apollo, stand for order. In sum, a greatly technologically advanced civilization existed before the Ice Age and its survivors sailed the earth to teach others about technologies regarding agriculture, architecture and the use of fire. And just as a side note, in English parlance, civilization usually means the most, the most advanced stage of a human society. In a German context, as we learn from Oswald Spengler, civilization rather means the end point of a high culture, a culture so extremely pushed to its limits that it has already exhausted itself and is now giving itself over to techno-scientific advancement, which it pursues only for the sake of advancement. According to Spengler, the author of The Decline of the Occident, Der Untergang des Abendlandes, civilization means that the high culture has already died. All that remains to do now is optimization of technology, not least of weaponry and arms, and of course also of money and financial services. Hence, a civilization does not really need an external shock, like the impact of a meteor, to decline. It is its own decline. It is striking that Hancock understands civilization mostly as technological and scientific, and not in terms of religion, myth or philosophy. But when I here now refer to civilization, I will do so in the sense of Hancock. So I'll just use his understanding of it here to make this a bit more accessible. Hancock has made it his life project to try and prove the existence of this pre-Ice Age civilization. Yet I think he would have to permit the question what would actually happen if this hypothetical ancient civilization were actually accepted by academia and by everybody else. Would not then at some point a new question arise which says, well, where did this most ancient, most advanced society come from? You see, was there not one other equally advanced civilization before that pre-Ice Age advanced civilization and before that one and before that one ad infinitum? Empiricism can only ever lead to more skepticism. And indeed, for that very reason, empiricism always leads to an infinite regress and actually to a breakdown of meaning. What's more is that even if we had impeccable proof, proof and all the data one could wish for to corroborate without, the, with a shadow of, without a shadow of a doubt this other earlier civilization, then this would still not mean that we had any genuine access to their life world, that is to say to their ways of being and their ways of orienting themselves in the world. What would it change simply to have the facts changed about which civilization came first, if we feel no and have no genuine connection to it? I'd like to illustrate this with an example. We now have, let's say, near perfect access to ancient Egyptian civilization and its achievements. We can go visit the pyramids. We can read their language, we the hieroglyphs. Can, we can recount go to their many stories. museums we across can visit the world, for example, example, in London. And they do, of course, speak to us. Yet in some significant sense, they also remain strangers to us, much more so than the Greeks or the Romans. Hence, the tradition of European humanism has never based itself on Egypt. This is because the Egyptian civilization depicts an attempt to capture only the eternal and set it in stone. The human being, after all, a being that dies, disappears behind these attempts. Hence, their symbol is the pyramid, which Hegel refers to as an abstract universality of a barren duration. The pyramid 
is the rigid symbol of death, a tomb from which all of life has flown. And that's striking. In, in, in an attempt to overcome death, they have created a culture and a civilization that purely is circled around death. Our increased knowledge of their life world has not and will not lead to a renaissance or renewal of us today going into the future. For their myths are not as deeply related to the human side of the dimension of memory as are Greek myths. In Greek myth, on the other hand, we find exemplary accounts of what it means to be human that still speak to us today. This is not to say that the Greeks are not strangers to us also. They are, and they remain so, but they remain related to us in the human dimension of memory. Just think of Andromache in Homer's Iliad, begging her husband Hector to stay, to stay with her and their son. Yet off he goes to fight Achilles, to meet his death and battle, which will forever separate him from his family without any possibility to reunite. This myth, or should I rather say this memory, still cuts through to us today, as it cuts through the rough brutality of the Iliad, the superficial yearning for approval that its heroes display. Andromache's courage cuts through the brutality, I say it again, and it cuts through the superficiality of such heroes as Achilles and Achamemnon, who purely, very often purely, do anything that they do for an external reception of honor. And this act by Andromache reveals a silent courage, a courage which in this form is deeply female, giving and yet not demanding. A form of courage which will continue to speak to us and encourage us to rise above ourselves. There is a moment early on in the series in which Hancock decries the artificial horizons set by archaeology and the need to tear down those horizons. It is also early on that Hancock points out the need for an archaeology of not of things but of ideas. So he advocates for an archaeology of ideas. Ideas, he says, are underpinning everything. And now this is a remarkable statement. And one would think that this is what Hancock is truly after. Yet, Hancock, at least here, does not follow through on this at all. Let us take this claim literally. It is ideas, forms, that underpin everything rather than facts or artifacts. They are also important, especially the artifacts, but they are not what underpin everything. The issue I see with the entire approach, and I think this is the only reason why this was allowed on the platform that it's on, is that while Hancock himself seems to be more open, more than open to this, he remains stuck on the purely empiricist level and indeed on the level of trying to provide verification for his theory, rather than pursuing the true scope of this realm of mnemonic ideas touched upon here. Thus, the true task is to delve into this realm of forms itself. In fact, the very notion of an archaeology of ideas translates to this. The saying often out of the arche, the primordial origin of the very forms which form the world. And those forms are at their very heart of memory itself, of what the Greeks called mnemosyne, the mother of the muses. And it is in our relationship to the muses that the origin comes forth. And one of the muses, of course, stands for history, one for poetry, etc. So let us now rather investigate this realm of ideas and forms and indeed of memories in which we humans differently and historically participate and never participate universally. These are a horizon, let's say, rather than a world to themselves. Yes, the stories of the great floods, of gods arriving at the shores, who bring great insight and order and law, stories found from Mexico to Egypt, those are not, I agree with Hancock, mere folklore. They are real, yet real not at all in an empiricist sense, and not in an idealist sense either. These are memories of Memoria herself. To bring this to the fore is the philosophical project that I have been working on for the past four years at least, 
and which I'm currently writing a book on, precisely because we in our time will be confronted with memory and time in a way that is already bending our very perception of everything that is as we speak. But I cannot say that much more here, but I will try and give a few more hints. Let me try and give a few more hints at the work of memory itself. The documentary features an old interview of Hancock with the BBC, where the interviewer asks Hancock about Atlantis. The interviewer asks Hancock whether Atlantis is not simply to be understood as an allegory, which Hancock denies. To Hancock, it is a real story of a city whose existence can be verified. Yet the question should rather be, what is an allegory? What does a meaning, where, sorry, does a meaningful allegory come from? What does it relate to us? And from which realm or dimension does it originate? How is it that an allegory, such as that of Atlantis, can at all be meaningful to us? What does this allegory remind us of? In our technocratic epoch, there is of course a tendency to disregard such remarks as mere mysticism. Yet, as we have seen, the empiricist approach which tries to pin down exact dates for the origin, for example, of you know, a civilization that came before this civilization, and that would lead to an infinite regress of a civilization before that civilization until, which is an embarrassment, one can only posit, as physics has done, the Big Bang, which is, if you think about it, just a demythologized uh, version of Genesis. Well, hence, let us understand what an allegory truly is, or rather what it says. The word allegory means to say or let something shine forth in something other. The false dichotomy or binary of true story of history and just the myth, which we live by, is in fact the horizon that needs to be torn down or pushed through in order to begin to learn again to see the world as inherently meaningful and interwoven with the divine and with memory itself. Let us consider the allegory of Atlantis in Athens to illustrate this a bit further. Yet we don't understand allegory here in the ordinary sense, but in the sense of deep memory. Hancock does not mention that Plato considers Atlantis only in regards to its counterpart, Athens. Both Athens and Atlantis can only be understood in light of each other, of its other, allegoria, saying something in the other. Speaking of Athens means to speak of Atlantis. Speaking of Atlantis means to speak of and to understand the sense of Athens and vice versa. This is a hint at mnemonic allegory. In Plato's dialogue Critias, which begins with a prayer to Mnemosyne, the goddess of memory, Plato describes Atlantis in its struggle with Athens and also relates why Atlantis sings. Atlantis sings because despite all its advancement, it begins to forget itself in a hectic frenzy. More precisely, Atlantis forgets what the Greeks called skolē, which is only poorly translated as leisure. Skolē is the mnemonic ground that offers itself to the human being in which as such a ground founds or allows for the foundation of the polis. As Plato relates, only when Skolē arrives in the midst of Athens does Athens become Athens. Skolē is what allows them to engage in, as Plato says, mythologia, mythology and appreciation of ancestry. Skolē is the measure of sufficiency which comes before all material wealth. It is only thanks to Scolè that one can at all appreciate material wealth. All of a sudden, their needs are met. Their needs are met in the sense that they realize that sufficiency is already in place. Thanks to Scolè can the Athenians begin to cherish memory. And it is memory itself which makes experience possible in the first place, as we know from Aristotle. Athens is founded on Scolè and as such Athens again, the mnemonic form of Athens, will remain to be grounded on Scolè and will wait for those who can ground it anew again. Whereas Atlantis, which is not built on Scolè, will always sink. And those who try to rebuild Atlantis, like Francis Bacon, will only build ruins. You may be aware that Francis Bacon wrote a rather strange uh, story about the new Atlantis. When Hancock addresses our forgetting of 
the ancient civilization, it would be misguided to assume that finding evidence for that civilization would make us unforget. Finding evidence in the form of data could even increase our forgetting in the sense of our understanding of ourselves. What Hancock gets at, without you know, having the attention to do so, with his aforementioned claim about amnesia, is however precisely that a great forgetting has set in. But it's a different kind of forgetting than what he thinks it is. We are indeed becoming unaware of ourselves. Yet this is not a problem that could be solved by finding evidence of a long lost civilization. Our forgetting of us today in our epoch would not be stopped by that. What is exemplified by Atlantis, forgetting itself, for which it is ultimately punished by Zeus, is a much deeper forgetting than forgetting historical data. Atlantis forgets memory itself, or Atlantis forgets the source. The frenetic or the frantic haste of Atlantis's harbors that never stand still, that are open all night, as Plato describes them, exemplify the, uh, exemplify the urge to continue to consume and trade so as not to collapse itself, within it, so as not to collapse. You see, it needs to be frantic and fast moving and always open because it has in some sense already collapsed. Atlantis is in so far as it is always sinking. It doesn't just sink at some point. To think and to speak of Atlantis means to speak of a mode of being that means that is always sinking. That is sinking as soon as it stops, as soon as it comes to rest. So it's, it's circling around itself. It needs to be busy and productive, etc., or else, and, cons and also consuming all the time, or else it crashes in on itself. So Atlantis stands for the forgetting. That's what the name Atlantis means. So the sinking of Atlantis is the literal, and not metaphorical, if we understand metaphorical in the usual sense, is the literal disappearance of the source of meaning within itself as it withdraws into itself and disappears. Looking for Atlantis does not mean to find stone traces in the Atlantic Ocean or anywhere else. Instead, it means to commemorate that such a forgetting is begotten from the hubris that comes precisely with a dying civilization that has already forgotten itself. That is to say, Atlantis is the almost the principle, as it were, that stands for the forgetting of the source, the forgetting of Scolaire, and is as such always in battle with Athens. So none of this is to be taken as allegory in the ordinary sense of purveying some hidden meaning by explaining abstract concepts uh, with the help of images. We speak in images, yes, or maybe those images speak to us and through us because they are off something deeper, and that's what I mean, they are off memory itself. So this is not to say that we just use Atlantis as some example that, that illustrates the principle of sinking, or let's say nihilism, to make this uh, very a bit too simplistic. And, and instead, the reason why Atlantis the story, let's say, is meaningful at all to us still today is because it speaks from out of a dimension in which there's nothing more real than Atlantis. And that dimension is what I, I refer to as memory. In that sense, Atlantis and primordial Athens are more real than any recorded city of history. It is striking that Hancock, for all his legitimate criticisms of archaeologists, falls into the very same trap of the privilege of the presence as do they. He reads myths simply as metaphors and even purifies them so as to appeal to his contemporary scientific audience. Take the example of the Egyptian god Osiris, Hancock references several times. Osiris arrives in Egypt and brings order, teaches agriculture, establishes laws. Hancock rationalizes this story to relate merely the arrival of some fantasized survivors of some hypothesized previous civilization. You see what lengths of hyperbole one has to go to to destroy this myth. The divine 
com the, the, the divine element, the, the, the dimension of divinity completely disappears behind this empiricist rationalization. The divine does not even remain as a metaphor or allegory, even in the ordinary sense. Moreover, Hancock reduces civilization to technology. Even temples are for him places not of worship. They are not sacred areas where a community gathers to worship the gods. Instead, to him, temples are ta machines tasked to track the movement of the stars and the sun in order to be able to predict potential threats from meteors. But why should civilization begin with technology? Is it not rather the arrival of scolaire, the advent of religion together with worship of the divine and appreciation of one's ancestors that means the beginning of true civilization? Hancock instead only worships technology and hence contributes further to the desacralization of the world and indeed of our past and ancestry. Hancock keeps coming back to the temples in Malta which are directed at Sirius or to the serpent mound in Ohio which is directed towards the sun. Yet the sacred significance of this is completely deconstructed further and further by Hancock throughout the series. The direction of these monuments is to have only militaristic significance. They are to track the movement of the heavens in order to be able to predict the next meteor catastrophe. Temples and sacred places are hence reduced to militaristic tracking devices, almost weaponry geared at the threat from the sky rather than being directed towards the heavens and the divine in order to become open for the receivership of direction from sun, stars and the gods. The gods have flown this world, as the German poet Hölderlin saw more than 200 years ago. The divine is at best something remnant now, yet it wasn't for our ancestors. They were indeed in touch with the divine, and that is what these testimonies relate to us. They are not folklore and they are not examples of some civilization past. They are testimonies to the divine dimension itself. Our ancestors were touched by the gods. They were the darlings of the gods. It is this memory we need to commemorate. It is this the memory we need to heed rather than beginning to understand temples as basically a uh, militaristic machinery and we if we heed this memory of the dimension of the divine so that's perhaps opening again us to be in the receivership for a return of the divine one day when the specter of scientific empiricism finally runs out of steam and i see this documentary as a moment in which really uh, it has become so embarrassing uh, the, the way in which we understand the world that it is now this is already the moment of an infinite regress you see and the reason why it's so popular uh, with the, with with um, with the viewers is because people are looking for the truth and for ancestry and for memory itself they're not getting it here obviously but it now as it were, the direction has to allow for this because it steers all of the, of the genuine wonder and amazement at who we truly are completely away from what is really happening and just re, restructures the entire story and tells, well, temples are just machines. They're just there to track the stars so that we have a, a radar system at hand by which we can uh, make sure the stars uh, don't become a threat to us, etc., etc., etc. So this is a redirection, really, that happens here, uh, while in some sense giving us a little bit of what human beings need, which is religion. Uh, but it doesn't, of course, allow it, because uh, it wouldn't be on the platform on which it is if it actually got at something real and not a complete fake nonsense as it, what it, sorry, that's what it is. The being of the gods in our time is being reduced to being replaceable. And this is exactly what Hancock does. He replaces the divine with 
some sort of fantasized advanced survivors of some civilization and at the same time their dwelling grounds temples are replaced to be what well to be as i said before basically uh, weaponry in a technocratic age of our decaying late state civilizations the gods are replaced so you could say that this documentary is in fact the proof to come back to the meaning of civilization in the spenglerian sense that we really are at the very end of this civilization and civilization in the sense of there's no high culture left there's no religion left all that's left is technological advancement optimization and money and high finance so weirdly enough it becomes a an example of human hubris itself so that's to say uh, well you know hancock turns the dwelling places of the gods into machines in his imagination and millions of viewers now believe the same and that is to say hancock does the very same that he accuses his academic rivals of he remains trapped in the presence and its technicistic way of explanation for the gods of old are not metaphors nor are the stories they relate instead the deeper sense of the dimension of memoria that weaves and strives through all that is. Why do we have all, at all any access, or how can we gain an access and understanding, not of the data about the past, but into the destinal world relationships of past worlds? How at all can we even begin to make sense of languages, symbols, artifacts, not our own? This is only thanks to memoria. And we should also accept that history itself, the destiny of memory, has never been only or even primarily about the human being. We play an important part, but we are not the only ones. Hence, in ancient apocalypse, not only the past is at stake about which one can be more or less correct, what rather is at stake is our future of being human. For the question who we are must always also address the question of our origin. After all, an apocalypse is the moment not only of decline or collapse, but of simultaneous decline and arising. Apocalypse means to be revealed, to be unconcealed, thanks to which, to this simultaneous decline and arising, thanks to which new horizons of meaning begin to shine forth. Hence, the title of the documentary, Ancient Apocalypse, begins to take on a different meaning than intended by its producers and its presenter. To wit, ancient apocalypse now begins to speak of the possibility of understanding the ancient times again in such a way that they inherently begin to relate to us, that their battles and tasks and memories arise again, resurface and indeed recur as our, as our own, coming towards us, becoming our future, speaking to us so that we may heal and so that we may become human again. In order to do so, we must again remember what has always been the task of the darlings of the gods, and which we are forgetting, of course, or which we have completely forgotten, and which at times even comes through, I have to say, in certain moments of uh, the presentation in Hancock. To wit, the task of the human being has always been to uphold the marriage of heaven and earth of gods and humans, and that is exemplified by temples. Now again, we must resist the modern urge to understand such claims as merely metaphorical. Instead, this reveals something crucial. The human being has a cosmic task. To be precise, the task of human being is to uphold the marriage between heaven and earth, between mortals and gods. To awaken to this task means to heed Hölderlin's gentle warning from his hymn, The Rhine, a hymn through which this river really flows. Here's Hölderlin. Then gods and men and all living things will celebrate their bridal feast, and fate is held for that while in balance. And hence we see that this, all this, has never been about the human being, but about memory herself. For Memnosyne, after all, is herself the daughter 
of Uranus, Heaven and Gaia, Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening again and if you'd like to contribute to my work here on this channel, please do so in any way you can. There will be several links down in the description of this video. Thank you.